Right now is whenever we used to sing. Ah. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you all my soul. Really, come on, sing it out to him. Take joy. To a new series, in case you haven't noticed by tools that many of you used to use, um, probably more of this uh, that you guys have used in your past, we are going to launch into a new series called The Sower and the Seed. And we're going to talk about sowing seed in our lives and, and how we have to cultivate that to help them to grow. And, and if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Matthew, the 13th chapter, we're going to start in verse 1. This is called the parable of the sower. Thus, the reason for the name, the sower and the seed. Parable of the sower. Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 1, and it says this. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and a great multitude gathered to him. So much that he got in the boat and sat, and the whole multitude had to stand on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell in stony places where they didn't have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of the earth. But when the sun came up, it scorched them because they had no root, and they withered away. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, and others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. He who has ears, let him hear. This is going to be a four-week series on the seed that is sown in our life. We're going to talk today about the seed that falls by the wayside. Uh, a little further in the, in the chapter, in verse 18, it says this. This is Jesus as He explains the parable, and He says this. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. Not comprehending, not understanding what God's word is speaking to you. And better yet, allowing the enemy to come in and to snatch from you what God is trying to do in your life. This is, this is uh, very evident in the church world today. We come in, we enjoy the service, we get spiritually full, see the sown into our life, and we get in the car and the wife looks at you wrong, and every bit of seed that was sown in your life has then been eat up by the birds, and you're sitting there at square one again going, God, sow something in my life. No? Nobody else is like that? Mm -hmm. you, have these, you have these emotional struggles in your life where, you're, where you're, you're, you, you, you've come so far and you're trying to get over maybe something that happened to you when you were small. Maybe it was a, a decision last week and you're struggling so bad with it on the inside. And you have these moments of, of seed being sown where you hear words of forgiveness and love and you say, I'm going to get over this, I'm over this, I'm, I'm walking forward, I'm over this. And then all of a sudden the, the enemy comes in and swoops in like birds and steals your seed from you and the same thing that you were struggling with that now you're delivered from and you're over because of that seed that was sown in your life now all of a sudden you're struggling with it again and you're back in the same spot that you once were. Anybody ever been there? Yes. Maybe for some of you it's in your marriage. Maybe you, you fall in love and you say honey I love you. This is so good. Things are going to change. That good seed pastor preached today about marriage. Heard Joyce Meyer today speaking about marriage. Heard this person speaking about marriage. And then, man this is so good. My, our life is going to be changed. And then all of a sudden you get home and you're going to tell her how beautiful your marriage is going to be. And honey, I love you so much. Things are changed. We're different. We're going to be a different couple. And all of a sudden before you know it, she burnt dinner. <laughs> and you were mad as fire because she burnt dinner. 
And then every bit of seed that was sown into your life now has been eaten up by the birds. And the enemy has come in and stolen it away from you. That's right. It, it, it happens in our life on a daily basis. This is, this is, this is who, we, who, we, who we are. This is, this is seed that gets sown in our life on a weekly basis here in church or in your mentorship with a, someone that's discipling you and, and they're sowing seed into your life and you walk away and you say, I'm going to be different, I'm going to be changed. And then all of a sudden birds come and eat that seed up that's been sown in your life. John 10.10 10 says this. John 10.10. 10. If, you, if you don't have that scripture underlined in your Bible, underline it, circle it, memorize it. It says this. The thief comes not except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, now let me just say this, okay? The attributes of God, of God are love. Love, that's an attribute, uh, attribute of God. Faithfulness, holiness. God cannot not love. I mean, that's just, that's just it's, it's an impossibility for him to not love someone. That's just God. That's just who he is. God cannot not be faithful. It's, it's an impossibility. That's, that's who he is. That's, that's his attributes. That's who he is. The enemy, our, our enemy, our adversary, he is the total opposite. He cannot not steal. Okay? He, he cannot not lie. I mean, that's, that's just what he does. If he tells you something and you say, that's not a good idea, guess what? He's lying to you. I hear people all saying, and, 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 and if you've said this to me, I'm talking to you, okay? Sometimes I say I'm not talking to you, but I'm talking to you. If you've ever said this to me, I think this is the stupidest comment I've ever heard church people make. It was so much easier whenever I was living in sin. Of course it was. Of course it was. He's got you. There's no reason to steal, to kill, or to destroy you because you've already been destroyed. You're living in sin. You're headed for a life bound for hell. There's no reason to stop you anymore. Let you do whatever you want. Go along your way. But when you're living a life that's bound for eternity with Christ Jesus, a life that honors and pleases Him, you're standing in a, in, in a place where you're trying to do your best and you're trying, guess what He, your adversary, is trying to do? To steal, to kill, and to destroy you. Yes. The story of Job. If you've never heard the story of Job, you should read it. Starts in Job 1 and goes to the end of Job. You should read it sometime. Job, though, Job is Job is, an, is, is a blessed man. Job has it all to get. Man, Job is blessed. You want to talk about blessed? Job's blessed. Let me read you some of the things that Job had. Job had seven sons, three daughters, an amazing wife, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, so that all the people around him called him blessed. This is who Job was. Job was a blessed man. Job had it all together. Guess what? The enemy came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What makes us think that our life is any different, that the enemy wants nothing more than to steal every bit of seed that has been sown in your life to stop you from producing fruit, to keep you from, from, from fulfilling the destiny that God has in your life? What makes you think that you're any different than Job, that he doesn't want to steal, to kill, and to destroy you? But the only thing that is stopping the enemy from taking you to a place where he took Job, where he took away all of his, all of his livestock, he broke down his houses, he killed his kids, and he was eat up with sores all over his body, to the place where his good, godly wife looked at him and said, you need to curse God and die. And Job said, if I'm going to curse God and die, I might as well worship God and, and, and die too. The only thing that's keeping you from that place... The only thing that's stopping the enemy from taking you to a place where he takes everything from you and destroys you is the hedge that God has put around your life to stop him from going into those places. Amen. And that's good. It's good. It's the story of Job. The enemy wants nothing more than to steal, to kill, and to destroy your life. He wants nothing more than to stop you from producing fruit. He wants nothing more than every bit of seed that's sown into your life to somehow remove that seed from your life to keep you from producing fruit. That's who he is. That's his attribute. He cannot not lie. That's, that's the story of Satan. That's who he is. And my dad used to always tell the story of, of, of these. It's, it's, it's not really biblical, so don't just go home and look for this today, okay? My dad used to tell the story of, of Satan as he was training these, these dark forces and, and, 
he calls these three up and he says, okay, you tell me whenever, now that you're finished with your training, I'm sending you to earth. You tell me what, the, what, what, what lie you're going to use to deceive the children of God with. And the first, the first devil says, you know, I'm, I'm going to use the, the lie that there is no God. And Satan kind of giggles and he says, ah, that's cute, except for everybody knows there's a God. I mean, look around you. How, how else was this place created? Of course there's a God. But good luck. Go try. Go see what happens. The second demon comes up to him and he says, Satan, I've got to figure it out. I'm going to tell him that there's no heaven. There's nothing to work for. There's no eternity. There's no, there's no heaven. And, and Satan kind of giggles and he's like, of course there's a heaven. You know, if they believe in God, they're going to believe in heaven. Because why else would Jesus come and give us life for him except for an eternity? Good luck. Go try that, that mild work. The third demon comes up to him and he says, Satan, i got to figure it out. I'm going to tell the children of God that they've got plenty of time. And Satan says, you know what, that is the greatest lie ever. And you will deceive millions upon billions upon billions of people with that lie. And children of God will die and go to hell because they think they have plenty of time. Any of you ever worked in a farm? Anybody, anybody ever worked on a farm? A few of us? A few of us? I don't know that I would call what I did working on a farm, but <laughs> working in my grandma's garden a couple of days. That's <laughs> <laughs> Sitting on a bucket picking butter beans. That ain't fun. There's a, there's a, there's a, and in, in, in your farming, since those of you who've never farmed, I can make up whatever I want right here, but there's a, there's a, there's in your, in your, in your farmer's almanac, there's a, there's a time to sow. Everybody understands that? Yes. There's, this is the time of the season to sow. This is when you sow. This is whenever you, 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 this is the time of the season when you harvest. This is the time whenever you dig up and get ready to sow. And there's, there's, this, there's this ebb and flow of, of how the, the, the crops work. And what we do in our Christian walk is we expect that same flow in our life. And we expect that, oh, it's not quite a good season to sow. Oh, God sowed this into my life last week, so, so I'll wait until next year when it's time to sow again, when it's time for the married couples retreat again, when it's time for the, 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 the pastor to talk about tithe again, then I'll start sowing. And when it's time for, for, for emotional healing again, I'll come. No, it's not, a, it's not that there's a time for, for sowing in our spiritual life. It's that every time seeds get sown into our life weekly or, or daily in your life, as, as seed is being sown, the enemy wants nothing more than to destroy it. And the greatest lie that he tells us is that, guys, you've got plenty of time. That's right. Husbands, don't worry about fixing your marriages. You've got plenty of time. Oh, your wife loves you. She'll stick with you through this. So one day she calls you and says, I'm done. Mm. Mm. Parents, don't worry about fixing that relationship with your child. You've got plenty of time. Children, don't worry about fixing that relationship with your parent. You've got plenty of time. Mm. Don't worry about dealing with that emotional issue on the inside of you because you have plenty of time. And the enemy tells us this lie, and all he's doing is stealing our seed that God is trying to sow into our life to see fruit and to see healing for you. Luke, Jesus says this in Luke, the 10th chapter, starting in verse 17. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall. As lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt you. I, I, I want you to get this. Listen, listen to me, listen to me real good. Part of that sowing seed and the and on the wayside, falling by the wayside, is not comprehending the word of God. That's what Jesus said in his explanation of the parable. I want you to grasp this fully, okay? I want you to understand this fully and let the seed that's being sown into your life, let it, let it flourish, let it bring fruit, okay? Jesus said, I give you authority to trample serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Listen, guys, we... we my, my parents used to say this, and I feel like it's a bad word. I feel like it's a bad slang term. But my, my parents used to say, 
stop allowing the enemy to treat you like, or for you to be treated like a redheaded stepchild. I don't know what that means. And if anybody's redheaded, I apologize. I don't mean any disrespect to that. Don't allow him to treat you like some redheaded stepchild. Like you're sitting at the table begging for bread from God's, from, from God's plate. No, that's not who we are. We are children of God. We, we have ownership in the kingdom of God. Here goes what Colossians 2 says. Colossians 2, starting in verse 13. You, being dead in your trespasses, in the ermine circumcision of your flesh, He has made you alive together with Him. You've got to understand that. You're alive with Him, having forgiven you of all trespasses, wiped out the handwriting and the requirements that were against you, having disarmed the principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Listen, in Him, you serve a God that in Him, He cre- he, he not only took control over every demonic force, He made the public, trampled over them and made a public spectacle of them. This is the God we serve. We don't serve some, some weak God that's still hanging on a cross. Our God is strong and alive and living and able to care for anything that you have need of. In Him, your life. In Him. In Him, having disarmed principalities of powers, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Ephesians 4.27 says, Give the devil no place in your life. Don't, don't even give him a foothold. Don't even, don't even give him a, a thought. Don't give him any place in your life because he does not deserve it. He's not worthy of it. James 4 says this, starting in verse 7, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Our society struggles with resistance. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Men, listen to me. If you struggle with anger issues with your wife, resist the devil. Okay? When you come in and, and things aren't like you expect them to be, resist the devil. Women, when you come in and the trash isn't take, taken out like you thought it should be, resist the devil. Okay? Stop allowing him a foothold in your life. When you walk out of here and, and, and you get good seed sown into your life and then you get in the car and, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you bump your toe on the way to the car and you get fighting mad, let me tell you something. Resist the devil. Yes. Stop giving him a foothold in your life. Stop assuming that he has some sort of authority or power over you because he doesn't. That's right. That's right. Resist the devil and what is he going to do? He's going to Please. flee. Resist him. Stop giving him a foothold in your life and then say, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. That's stupid. That way made you do nothing. You decided to do it. Resist him. And he will flee. John 4 and 4 says this. 1 John 4 and 4. You are of God. You, 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 before we go on this, this scripture is quoted a bazillion times. And before we get, it was in one of the songs we sung this morning. Before we can go on, you have to understand that first, you have to be in God. The same authority that he has over the demonic forces of this world, the same authority that he has over every principality and power is the same authority we have if we are in God. Okay, thank you. One God. Okay, hang in there. Hang in there. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. You've overcome because the one that's on your side is greater than anything of this world. The one that's on your side is the one that made a public spectacle of them. The one that's on your side has conquered every demonic force that there could ever be. And he is fighting for you as long as you are of him. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Stop assuming that you're some sort of, some sort of beaten, begging child that, that, that God doesn't want to do something amazing in. No. You're a child of God that he wants to 
allow to be an overcomer if you will do what he said for you to do. Stop allowing your seed to be stolen. Stop allowing your seed to be... The enemy cannot take your seed if you don't allow him to. Stop allowing your seed to be stolen. You have authority over the enemy. Right. You, you, you're scattering as hard as you can and you're thinking, you know, oh man, God, I, I just, I just want to see, see fruit come up and God's saying, well, take your rightful place. Your authority in the kingdom. Be of God and, and use His authority that trampled over principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them. Oh, that's good yes. work. Yes. Think of the story of, uh, I think of the movie, Back to the Future. Anybody ever saw the movie, Back to the Future? The first service, nobody did. <laughs> I think of the movie Back to the Future. That, they're a little older, just in case you're wondering. I think of the movie Back to the Future. Um, you remember the one where he gets the sports all in that? Yeah. Yeah, right. Chris, my man, you remember this story. You remember. <laughs> I think of that, and I think how cool that would have been in my younger days. Not now, in my younger days. If I were able to have all the sports knowledge in the world, and although this person is a 50 to 1 odd, I could go to Vegas and put all oh, my younger days, not now. I'm not condoning Betty. Put all my money on that. All, I'm going all in with this. I, I, I know the outcome because I've been to the future. I've got the sports almanac and I'm coming back and I know the outcome. And I say to us today, how, how unbelieving are we to have the ultimate sports almanac in our hands with the outcome to the ultimate battle and yet for some reason we refuse to go all in. That's good. We never watch Back to the Future the same. We have the ultimate end to what God said will happen to our adversary. We, we know how the story ends. And yet for some reason we allow him to take foothold in our life and to, to create some sort of stir and to, to have some sort of power in our life. Revelation 19 says this, starting in verse 11. Now I saw heaven open up and behold a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true. Not liar and thief and destroyer. He who sat on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges. His eyes were like flames of fire and out of his head were many crowns. His name that was written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. Listen, I said this first service has absolutely nothing to do with my message. But if you want to know how to read your Bible. Because his name is called the word of God. Mm, that's good. Certainly. We'll come back to that later. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 20, starting at verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon and the serpent of the old, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should not deceive the nations no more. Wow. I, I tell the devil that sometimes. Shut up. One day he is going to be shut up. This is, this is, this is the ultimate sports almanac. This is the ultimate, we have it in our future. We understand what's going to take place. We know that the attacks of the enemy on our life, the things that he throws at us, the, the tricks that he used to, to, to lie and to deceive and to steal from us and to destroy us, the things that he uses against us, one day will be bottled up and thrown away and, and, and shut up tight. And we have to understand that our place as a child of God is to be 
in Him and of Him and take our rightful place here on this earth so that He stops coming in like a bird to deceive and to steal away the seeds that are sown in our life. Take your authority, take your place, and allow Him to, 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 to flourish those seeds that are sown in your life. Stop allowing the enemy to come in and to steal those things from you because of anger or fear or greed or, 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 or other things that, that rise up inside of us. Stop allowing him to take your seed from you. Take your rightful place and say, say, enemy, you have no authority over me. Because the same scripture that says, John 10, 10, you can flip back there for me, Billy. John 10, 10, the same scripture that says, uh, John 10, 10, the thief comes Except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that you might have life. That you can have life more abundantly. God doesn't want to be up there like Zeus with this big pitchfork shooting lasers at you. That's not what he wants from your relationship. God's not sitting there with you under his foot ready to crush you at any moment like a cockroach. That's not what God wants from you. God wants you to understand that the enemy wants nothing but to steal and to kill and to destroy. And he wants nothing but for you to have life and to have life more abundantly. Amen. Amen.